morning, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to present our first panel on the second day on a topic that I think we're all very well aware of, which is the war on the woke and how it is affecting our universities, how including cancel culture and lecturers being cancelled and so on. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, hand over to our moderator, Rodrigo Ballester. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, and good morning to everyone. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you also to New Direction for inviting us or for having the good idea of putting up this panel and to do so under those terms, the war on walks. We are here to speak about a lot of things, for example, about Kathleen Stock, an English scholar, by the way, a lesbian, who resigned after being harassed by mobs of trans students. And he was all, she was also totally let down by her hierarchy at the University of Sussex. What did she do? She just reminded that biological sexes are a reality and that women are women, not menstruators or breeders. We are here to speak also about the toolkit launched by the University of Amsterdam to decolonize it, whatever that means, or to speak that Beethoven is white, pale and stale, or that Mozart, as we all knew, is first of all an imperialist, according to the Faculty of Musicology of Cambridge. We are here also to speak about the resignations of Peter Bogosian or Jordan Peterson in the resounding silence of their colleagues, or about the infamous dismissal of Joshua Katz, a world-class expert in Princeton, who was sacked because he disagreed that black professors should be paid more just because of their pigmentation. We're also here to speak about deconstructing math curricula, because as we all know, science is systematically racist, about the compulsory gender dimension of EU research funds, even if you're going to launch a project on stem cells, for example, or about the extremely well-paid university bureaucrats of the so-called diversity, inclusion, and equality department, little bureaucrats who impose a deleterious atmosphere of witch hunt, suspicious, and denunciation. By the way, their acronym, diversity, inclusivity, and equality is DAI. We are here to speak also about the woke version of Mao's cultural revolution performed by white, privileged urban snowflakes in hoodies and sneakers. Mobs that are courageous enough to harass teachers but need a safe space to recover from opinions they dislike. Poor them. We are here to speak about the triumph of mediocrity and ignorance. We are here to speak about a dystopia one more woke dystopia. Because in Wokeland, doctors don't heal. They mutilate teenagers. In Wokeland, combating racism means the exact opposite of Luther King's color blindness. And in Wokeland, the allegedly best universities charge $80,000 a year to indoctrinate. And by Wokeland, by the way, I don't only mean Canada. <laughs> I, mean, I mean the Western world. We are therefore at war. A war against freedom, but also a war against knowledge, against reality. And the title of today's panel is actually spot on. It's not the war of the wokes, it's not our war, it's not something we want to study today. It is our war against them. And today we were not going to discuss the reasons of how to resist, but how to win it. And to do so we have three distinguished, insightful and determined panelists. First of all, Stephen Bartulica, you are a member of the Croatian Parliament, also a professor of philosophy at the Catholic University of Zagreb, and uh, a cultural activist, if I may call you like that as well. David Engels, you are the chair of the Roman Studies in the Université Libre, or allegedly Libre de Bruxelles. So maybe you will also tell us a bit more about how Libre this university is. Also a Réunion author, you wrote in 2013 like a very popular book called Le Déclin. Uh, you just published recently also Europa Eterna. And Ignacy, Ignacy Grau, you are the director of OIDEL. OIDEL is the leading NGO, I would even say a, co a federation of NGOs. Um, that promotes freedom of education in, uh, in, in, in international uh, fora. So we, we met already in Brussels some years ago. It was a pleasure. Uh, so without further delay, um, and again, dear panelists, we also would like to finish this session with some concrete hints about how 
to start winning this war. Not understanding it, not resisting it, but how can we win it? Stephen, if you had half a million dollars in your pocket today, would you send your kids to study to Harvard, Princeton, Berkeley, Stanford, or any other Ivy League university? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I want to first thank uh, New Direction for inviting me, and I'm very pleased that we uh, have this panel uh, today. It's, um, I think, critical to uh, address this issue. Uh, as a father of four, uh, when I'm asked that question, um, I, when I moved to Croatia uh, in 1992, I would have uh, likely uh, been uh, very pleased with the prospect that one of my children uh, could go to Harvard. Today, uh, when I'm asked uh, this question or any Ivy League school, I would say um, it would be an interesting proposition if perhaps uh, they were accepted to go for uh, no tuition. So I, I would maybe consider it if it was free, perhaps. Uh, to pay that kind of money is completely out of the question. Um, I'm more concerned with uh, their spiritual well-being, the fate of their uh, immortal soul, and I think that these universities today in America are so hostile to um, the Christian view of the human person, but also to common sense, to right reason, to uh, freedom of speech, they're, they're, they're toxic, really, and um, subversive. Uh, so I would, in that sense, I would not want to lose my son. And so I would, I, my answer is that I would not even send him for, for free to go to these uh, universities. Uh, I think that's the reality. I think Harvard now has elected a new head chaplain who's a self-avowed atheist. So we have uh, uh, a leading American university with uh, a chaplain who's responsible for the care of the students who uh, denies God's existence. Um, we were talking a lot about uh, freedom. Um, what are the ends of freedom? Uh, we can't talk about freedom without including uh, the moral good. We have to discuss what is good for uh, human beings, uh, because freedom is not an end in itself. It's a precondition for human flourishing. We have to talk about virtue, how to cultivate virtue, not undermine virtue. That's basically the role of these Ivy League schools. Um, I would suggest reading a book by the American philosopher Freedom from Reality. Uh, David Schindler uh, wrote this book. It's a thick read, uh, very dense and uh, full of um, deep philosophy, but uh, his argument is that you know, it's a negation of freedom uh, to, to deny objective reality. Uh, and this is what we're dealing with, this woke uh, ideology. It's a sort of uh, madness, insanity, that um, unfortunately has obtained real power and that's why it's become such a menace. There's real power behind it. So in Croatia, um, there's still safe places. My university is, is, is among those places. So I'm pleased to say that uh, I, I can teach uh, freely as a uh, professor of uh, moral philosophy in Zagreb. I probably wouldn't be able to do that at many uh, places in America, including Catholic universities, I'm sorry to say. Um, but the reality is that when you look at the past and uh, how ideologies uh, function in reality, uh, my students, you know, when they hear about Marx and his theory of uh, the human person, of history, and so on, they, they, I think, relatively easily see the flaws in his thinking and that, uh, you know, this experiment had to end very badly. Uh, but the reality is that the communists had lots of power for, for many decades and did great harm. And one of the reasons they were able to do this is that, uh, well, they were ruthless, of course, and they killed uh, their enemies. But uh, once they were in power, too many people conformed and simply uh, remained silent. And I think that's a very important lesson for us today because the methods used by this woke uh, mob um, especially at universities, is, uh, is very similar. Intimidation, um, 
you know, it's, it's very difficult to survive as a professor in this environment. I had the privilege of having dinner with uh, Jordan Peterson just recently in Zagreb. He spoke to a full packed theater and uh, we, over dinner, I asked him when he was under attack, uh, did he receive any uh, support from his colleagues at the University of Toronto? And his answer was no. Absolutely no one supported him. And we're talking about a leading thinker, uh, probably the most cited um, professor at the university at the time, and he was simply thrown under the bus. They let him go. So that's the reality we're facing. And his conclusion is that it's better to start over and that uh, his former university is doing more harm than good. Thank you, Simon. We will, we will come back to that when, when we'll speak also about the possible solutions. Um, David, would it be possible for Stephen to teach in the ULB? for example, and what, what was your experience there and how you see the situation, you know, more from a European point of view? Mm. Yeah, difficult, difficult question, of course. Um, I think that one of, one of the main issues in, in changing universities from, uh, from the within uh, lies uh, with the fact that as, as, as many, but perhaps not all of you are, are aware that the nomination process depends, of course, largely on cooptation. Uh, so if a new professor is nominated somehow, uh, he is nominated by a selection by, of, his, of his colleagues, often also by students, by different um, diversity representatives. And that is a system um, that once a university is essentially dominated by leftist liberalism, doesn't allow a uh, way back, finally. Conservatives in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, when they still not necessarily dominated universities, but were very present at, uh, at, at universities, opened these universities, uh, universities to leftists, to greens, and so forth. That was the beginning of the long march through the different institutions uh, of, the, of the left. But now that the left is in charge of universities, now they won't commit the same error. They won't admit uh, 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 professors from more let's say, conservative uh, orientations. That is why I think it is impossible to change universities from the within, even more so uh, as uh, um, future professors or academic teachers, of course, uh, are, are not left alone. Uh, they are obliged from the beginning of their studies, during their whole career, to reassert time and time again their commitment to the leftist cause. Uh, today, if you want to get a PhD grant, you need to do something, at least in the humanities, that is somehow linked to gender, migration, LGBT, whatever. If you do some classical subjects, then you will really have big problems in finding financing. If you want to become professor, then you also you need to have a whole agenda where you explain how you will proceed in order to assure gender, equality, migration quota, and so forth. So during your whole career, you are obliged to repeat that commitment. You can't just, as many uh, people uh, may, may hope, just somehow enter uh, incognito university and then from, from the within didn't change it. You, you have to, to reassert all the time this, this commitment and, and fully uh, also somehow um, yeah, uh, compromise you on the leftist side of uh, the political spectrum so that uh, once even you reach a post, then you are so you have compromised yourself so strongly on the leftist side of, of the political spectrum that you can't also somehow go back in a credible way. So uh, that's why it is becoming more and more difficult for students, for professors, uh, PhDs and so to enter most universities if they are conservatives and why I'm very skeptical about that. I, the only solution for me, uh, but I guess we will speak about that later, uh, is, uh, is of course to, to found new institutions. I'm very skeptical about the possibility of changing most of them from from the inside, at least from my experience. And of course, my university where I taught for 10 years in Brussels is uh, probably one of the most spectacular examples of, let's say, uh, very openly uh, uh, leftist, liberal, and very decidedly anti-Christian uh, university, something of a, like, like a, a flagship, you could say, of that uh, political orientation. And we, we could add the, the word libre, free, as one of those very dystopic, dystopian words, you know, that um, uh, Professor Le Goudke, uh quoted yesterday that are actually mean exactly the opposite of what they're supposed to mean. Uh, and it's true that uh, speaking about Belgium as well, as, well, I was also shocked to hear two or three years ago they gave the, uni the Catholic University of Leuven 
gave a doctor, is, a doctor honoris causa to Kimberly Cripshaw, who is basically the mother of intersectionality, which is intellectually a nonsense and politically and socially toxic. Um, Ignacy, before we, we continue on, on the campus and the universities, since you have a global point of view on education, tell us also, please, how rotten the apple is at the level of primary education and secondary education. And also, if you can have a word on parents. My impression is that this work education is totally parentophobic, in the sense that it's meant to undermine the authority of parents and basically atomize the family as an institution. What is your stance on that, please? Well, first of all, I want to thank once again a new direction for the invitation and most important, I think it's really important that from the conservative spaces like we talk and we talk about education and we take it seriously so we can start building an, an alternative and I'm really happy to participate in, in such a forum because of this reason. Um, I want to start with uh, some sort of good news on regards of parents that still today the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in its Article 26 recognizes the rights of parents, the Convention on International um, rights for economic, social and cultural rights still recognize the rights of parents and also recognize the right of individual bodies to create their own institutions. And still most of the European constitution recognize the rights of parents. Having said that, I mean, there is definitely some threats and what I would identify today like the biggest threat um, is this idea that is being developed that freedom has autonomy. Um, a few years back, um, a group of writers of so-called liberals from the United States that start calling um, the importance that education has to free the students from, from their circumstances. No? They talk about we have to force children to be free, free from their cultural background, free from the their religion of their families, and they, therefore what they are saying is we have to submit children to the different models of good life. You know, the ones they are adults, they can choose who they want to be. We have to remember here that the international community, it's, it's hard for the international community to agree on consensus at the same way that the constitutional level, but if we recognize parents' rights, it's because we thought like, um, even though the right to education is a right for children, when we are talking about primary and secondary, due to the lack of the capabilities, we decide like we are gonna make parents responsible for that, and therefore we are gonna make them responsible. I we are gonna give them rights. The problem with this idea of um, freedom as an autonomy is that first, of course, there are some, good mod some models of good life that are going to be discriminated. And we are already seeing that. No? Like, you cannot, you cannot um, show all the models of good life. And it's impossible to show just in a few classes how deep is, for instance, Judaism, Christianism, or other models. The second model is like, if autonomy is the goal to achieve, the models of good life that are more likely to create an autonomous kit um, are going to be privileged over the ones that maybe like the religious ones that are um, forcing the forcing the citizen to follow a, a, a set of moral rules. And third is like in a democracy, the moment like we recognize autonomy as freedom because parents and civil society are a threat. This is some sort dangerous because we are seeing parents and the civil society with suspicion and as something that as a group of people that we cannot trust and. Here again, I want to go on a thing that we all agreed, which is the aim of education that sometimes forget. Like many debates on education, they say education is for equality, it's for even emancipation. But what we know, what we agreed at least, is that um, the aim of education is the free development of human personality. And here, when the people who draft the Universal Declaration, they were not thinking we want people to be really charismatic, but that they can develop as personas, as human beings. And this does not mean like this idea of force them to be free. It means like that they know who they are, that they know where we're we coming from, that they know what is my community around me have as beliefs and what are the cultural context in which I come, how can I connect with the people. And as identity is not, it's not something frozen, parents maybe are still the best actors to make sure that education um, can ensure this idea of the, fru the full development of human personality. I think especially this is important when we are thinking of these people going to higher education, like if people don't know who they are, later when they are going in, in such savage debates as the one we were saying, it's impossible for them to negotiate their identity and think who they want to be as they are, as a consumer in a supermarket that they just have to pick what do I like the most. 
So I think more or less, I would say like in just a few minutes how I see the main challenges of primary and, and secondary education. Thank you, Ignacy. You, you, you wouldn't be able to repeat that in uh, Berkeley or Harvard, but here I think it's absolutely okay. And, um, and now precisely, let, let's go now to the, to, to the root of the problem. What do we do? Uh, and here are two topics I wanted to, um, to raise to all, the, um, to all the panelists. First, do we start from scratch, universities, or do you think there is still a chance we can revert them from within? In other terms, in 30 years' time, would it be a good idea to have a diploma from Harvard? Would you be hired or not? Uh, would it stop being prestigious? And again, if we, stop, if we start doing you know, more conservative or more real free universities, can we also escape the trap of this ideological bias that basically is killing the current ones? How do you see that, dear panelists? Stephen, please. Yes, we, we should certainly be talking about this. Um, and it's good that uh, conservatives are paying attention to uh, the culture in the wider sense. Uh, a free economy, economic growth, uh, talking about the role of government, that's all very important. But in the end, uh, culture determines the direction you know, every nation uh, will take. And uh, so we, we have to um, take time and, and, and consider this. Uh, I would say, um, looking at the reality today, um, it's difficult to imagine that we can uh, win the universities uh, back. I, I would agree with David that um, the left uh, has no mercy when it comes to, um, you know, employing or implementing its, its uh, view of the world and exerting power. Um, they know how to obtain power, they know how to intimidate, and, uh, you know, looking back at the, the lessons of history, really what happened in 1989 with the collapse of communism is, is a unique moment in history where you have a sudden um, change and an advancement of freedom. Uh, that's very rare in human history. Um, and so in a way, it's, it's kind of a miracle when you think about what, what, what was happening under the surface that the communists in the end gave up power um, freely uh, Croatia had to fight a war to uh, liberate itself from Serb occupation, but basically in Central and Eastern Europe it was a peaceful uh, transition of power, which is very rare in history. Um, it's not easy to gain prestige, so my, universities, my university in Zagreb is a new university, it's only about 10 years old. So many of the students still prefer to study at the public university uh, in Zagreb because it's older, has more prestige. So we must be aware that if we do start from scratch, it takes time to build a reputation and to compete with these universities. And Stephen, it takes money as well. It, yes, it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of money and um, we have to find allies, obviously. There are people, I think, who are aware of what is at stake uh, but many people uh, who maybe agree with us uh, aren't fully uh, dedicated or not willing to, you know, uh, give millions of dollars for, for this en endeavor. There, there has been a few examples um, of new, un new universities in America as well, and I think they're doing relatively well, but their influence on wider society is still marginal, I would say. So this is a, a, a long-term... Uh, view. It, it will be uh, years and years uh, until we can really seriously compete with these um, existing institutions. And like I said, the, the reality is, is that today this ideology is being pushed uh, on countries like Croatia, but it's a very different kind of propaganda. You know, now you have um, countries that are very wealthy that are that have become woke. Uh, communism had a certain, you know, ugly feature. It was brutal. Uh, most of these countries were materially uh, backward and poor, and so it was maybe in that way easier to resist. Well, what we're facing today maybe is a, is a more difficult uh, enemy, and um, we have we have to be aware of the, have to be aware of this. And and as conservatives, like I said, we should not yield. What we can do is uh, surely support 
uh, those professors who are speaking out and trying to uh, fight back that, that have tenure or are teaching uh, at these places. Jordan Peterson received almost no support and in the end resigned as one example. Uh, but usually they're, they're able to you know, quickly uh, remove these uh, dissidents and uh, that's a problem because they don't come back. Um, Peterson is maybe uh, unique because he's become so uh, well known that he doesn't need the universities anymore, but we don't have many people like him. So what, what about the younger professors who maybe agree with him but have to be quiet and keep that uh, secret? My, my, my uh, colleagues in the Department of Psychology tell me before they attain uh, a certain uh, stature, uh, in the university, at least docent, associate professor, they have to be careful about what they're publishing because it's enough for one peer or a professor, uh, you know, judging their work uh, to block their, their advancement. So we have to be, you know, smart as well, May, not too cautious, but, but smart uh, in order to survive. Thank you. And in speaking about money, again, let me remind you that today the 72 billion euro of the research, European research funds are conditioned to a mandatory requirement of gender dimension. So for every project. David, would you, if you had 20 billion euros, would you buy the ULB and uh, change it upside down? What would you do? <laughs> yeah, that might be, of course, a, a nice idea. No, I, I can, I can just agree with uh, with what you said. Uh, and even the notion of tenure is being deconstructed. Like in the UK, for example, where there is this debate: uh, Do we really need to conserve tenure, or shouldn't we also uh, make depend tenure on a regular publication output? And we all know that today, publication that means publication in peer-reviewed journals, uh, which are, of course, within this this, this system uh, uh, and where, of course, peer review means that very often uh, those papers who are not really uh, fitting to the general scholarly ambience and atmosphere and so are, are, are rejected. So one little issue, one text, one book you have written that is not absolutely corresponding to the leftist liberal doxa and your career is, is ended. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm somehow also an example for, for, for many of these, uh, these topics. I think um, that, as, as I said, we, we need new universities. We have to found new schools, new universities, new academies, but uh, we have to, to be aware uh, that ju just creating new institutions won't, won't solve anything. There are two dangers or two, two risks. The one is, of course, that these new institutions, uh, in, in order to, to attract students and to have a more, let's say, easy life or so on, they, they, they crave, of course, a certain level of, let's say, uh, compatibility with the already existing places so that they can also get homologization from the state, so that they can uh, put exchange programs uh, and so forth. So there is this risk, this temptation for many of these new conservative uh, um, uh, universities not to exaggerate, to remain below the radar, to remain moderate. And so somehow they become part of the system. That is, that is one of the risks. They are not absolutely free because they have to adapt themselves to a general university um, uh, context. That is one of the risks. The other and uh, much more important is that university and education is unfortunately not just uh, l'art pour l'art. It, it, it was perhaps in the 19th century in the Humboldtian University where you basically you did your studies not necessarily to get a job but to become a, a, a whole person somehow. Today that's not anymore the case and so we have to see that these universities in order to attract people and to be useful also need to, to lead them somewhere and if we have universities that are not recognized by the state as is the case with many any conservative universities, then why should the student who needs a job afterwards go to such a place? And so w w that is why we, we, we need not just to think about universities, but how they, they can serve the students. And they can only serve if, on the, on, the other, on the other hand, we also have businesses. Businesses which would accept students from non-recognized universities. That is, I think, the, the, the important correlation of these new universities. We need places uh, that are somehow 
dominated either by conservatives or that are, let's say, open-minded and, 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 and that would say, okay, I know that people formed at that university have a good uh, level of formation, even if their bachelor, master, or whatever, is not recognized by the state. So we need that correlation. That is, I think, extremely important and we do not yet have it. And I think that is something we, we, we need to work on so that these universities can become competitive, are recognized at least in an unofficial way and thus can thrive and then receive money also by these businesses who think, okay, they form good students, so we can also give them some money in order to help them work. Well, that's, that's indeed a very good point and the question today is, is a graduate from the, from the University of Austin, which today is probably the, the spearhead against wokeism in the US, be hired in Facebook or in Google or in L'Oréal? That's a fair question indeed and maybe the answer is in 2022, Certainly not. It will be cancelled because it doesn't come from the right work uh, uh, universities. Ignacy, let's speak a bit about teachers as well. We see that in the US, teachers and teachers' union especially are definitely part of the problems because they, you know, unapologetically, you know, turn into woke gurus. And so they openly tell you, uh, you have a lot of TikTok videos about it, that, oh, I'm here to indoctrinate kids, I'm here to speak about the pronouns and things like that not to teach them. Are teachers the problem as well, at least part of them, and how can we address that? I think one of the problems that we have here more than teachers is like some people <laughs> identifying teachers as an homogeneous reality, no? because for instance, I'm seeing in some of the debates like people talk talking on behalf of teachers, they're just talking on behalf of teachers, for instance, of public schools. Um, and, and I think teachers are not, and we, we have to, the same way parents are not the same, that's why we are talking about, when we are talking about parents, everybody think about freedom of education. The same thing we have to identify like teachers are not an homogeneous reality. And By the way, we are all teachers on the stage. <laughs> no, and in the, in the, I'm thinking the first debates on freedom to education in France, for instance, um, were thought on the idea of choose your own teacher, you know, more than the parent is like everybody, every senior citizen should be able to choose by who does he wants to be educated, acknowledging that there is a diversity among teachers. And I think that's one of the first steps to overcome this reality. It's true especially, um, but this is having an impact, I would say, in the international debates that the power of American unions, um, of teachers' American unions are really big, and this is shaping the debate on, around teachers already in Europe. But the reality, we, we just have to acknowledge the complexities of reality. And if I may... But, but Ignacy, concretely on those ideologized teachers, so let's not generalize, you're right, but those teachers who are openly gurus, what do we do to, to basically cancel them, if I may? Um, well, I, I'm going to give an answer that maybe it's also connected with the idea of, of creating new universities. That I think one of the problems we are having... Um, as conservative is like, um, many times our reaction is like, we want a new school because we don't want to be you, no? But what is the, what is the conservative approach, no? Like, what are we, what do we have to offer? We know we don't want to be that, but what do we want to be? And I think here there is a, um, I'm, I'm sort of optimistic on that, why? Because I think despite this idea of autonomy and despite this idea of emancipation that I think it's one of the red points that connects what the so-called woke movement, I think still um, human being is driving into truth, beauty and, and goodness. And we can see like, I live in Switzerland and you put anyone in front of a mountain and still their reaction is that that's a beauty thing. And still people can identify good actions. And I think that's part of our nature and they cannot remove that from us. But freedom in the field of education is an acknowledgement. It's, when we talk about freedom, it's like, we acknowledge that there is these goods and freedom is like a tool, as we were saying before, as a means to arrive at. And I think like we, for, as conservative, as far as we are not um, building a, a strong message on this regard that could be an opposition, yeah, we will be able to do a few things, but I think it's important here to have an intuitive answer because I mean, not, all, not, not every regular citizen can afford to be an intellectual and spend hours on this topic, but we have to have an intuitive answer so regular citizens can say, listen, what you are doing is against these three principles that any, ch any kid can relate to. And I think that's part of the intellectual challenge that we are having now as conservatives. I can see, very interesting. You, you mentioned the good, the beauty, and the truth. 
the classics, the classics, and precisely here, I mean, at least two, two of the of the of the speakers on stage are are, are classic professors. Uh, David, you are a Romanist. Uh, Stephen, you are a professor of philosophy, and I have the impression as well that wokeism is a blossoms on the seeds of ignorance and stupidity and actually lack of culture. No. Um, is, do you think it, that part of the solution is to come back to the basics? That we teach more history, more geography, more philosophy, more mathematics, uh, more literature in schools? Did you have the impression that those classic disciplines were basically like, um, uh, like a vaccine against stupidity and now we remove them and on that basis, you know, everyone was caught off guard basically to spread the stupidity of wokeism, because it takes, I think, to read a couple of books, basically, to dismantle uh, one by one all the woke arguments, but still, they are over-hegemonic. What do you think about it? Is it part of the solution? Yes, certainly. I, I, would, I would agree. Uh, we have to also protect uh, children at their early stage of uh, development and education, so when they get to university, they're still capable of grasping uh, these basic uh, truths. Uh, the left is very good at uh, indoctrinating uh, very young children, so that they're, they're uh, pushing uh, gender theory as early as preschool in some countries. Uh, now in uh, Croatia, we have a uh, radical left green uh, mayor in Zagreb, and he's very interested in um, introducing these ideas in uh, elementary schools uh, without the consent of parents. So w we have to be vigilant and aware that this starts very early. We have to um, promote uh, parental rights and fight back so these children are not exposed uh, very early uh, to these uh, ideas because they're so nonsensical and contrary to uh, human experience that you indeed have to introduce them very early when children are almost def defenseless uh, against this, this kind of um, indoctrination. Um, but at the university, certainly, uh, I try to go back to the basics. So many of my students who are uh, at the Catholic University of Zagreb uh, have never you know, um, heard the ver word virtue. Um, the, it's, uh, it's very unclear to them what, what virtue means. Uh, also, the human soul and uh, you know, basic things in uh, Western civilization about the human person, um, the, the human nature, what is um, the good life. They have not thought through these, these questions. So we have a huge responsibility, but also I would say um, uh, an opportunity if we insist that this curriculum, which was considered uh, basic and fundamental for, for centuries, that it be uh, re reintroduced. I am very much an advocate for classical education. Um, uh, I tell my students uh, to read uh, Cardinal Newman's book on the idea of a university, wh why universities exist, for what purpose, uh, to cultivate the mind, to instill certain habits of thinking, and uh, that's been lost. And of course, when that's been lost, uh, crazy ideas can, can spread, unfortunately. And um, David, you're an, uh, an expert in the Roman Empire, so I guess that you know, uh, skills, project-based learning and team building are, are not among the skills that you are promoting in your uh, teaching. Um, would you agree with that as well? I mean, for example, is it better to, I mean, do youngsters today, would they understand better the current world if they knew the basics of the Roman Empire, for example? They would most certainly, but it's 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 not just a thing about um, knowing facts. I mean, this 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 problem goes 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 back also to many other reasons. Um, you you we spoke about stupidity, for example. Uh, well, media's are, are systematically training people of not having an attention span that is longer than thirty seconds or one minute. So that that is something that that is endemic. That is that is everywhere. So if we want to fight against many problems we have to start there at this place also even of, of training people of just having a longer attention span. Another fact is that schools at least from my experience not only in Belgium and in Germany but also in uh, in, in, in Poland are um, uh, um, 
uh, missing every opportunity or are, are not managing uh, to <coughs> to educating um, uh, students or, or young people to basic skills such as just reading one page of one, one, one page of text in their own mother language and understanding it so one of the biggest problem I had in all the universities I worked is that when even I wanted to work with the students on the sources that even if I said well read that text from a biography of, 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 of uh, whoever ancient ancient general or whatever uh, uh, was that after uh, they, they are not even able to understand one page in their other in their own own mother language so that is of course also something that is that is extremely difficult uh, then to to work with um, then we come of course to to things like uh, like the facts but um, of course uh, the the leftist school system the academic system tries deliberately so I think to muddle things like chronology, like facts, they do this project based based things so that people in the end are absolutely uh, have, have no idea about chronology, about timeline, about general education. So I think that is something that is really some form of very conscious uh, uh, cultural Marxism somehow destroying any form of <coughs> systematic knowledge in order to enable or to make it e e easier, of course, for, for, for themselves to indoctrinate them. But it's, as I wanted to say, it's not not just about facts, it's also about their interpretation. It's, it's, it's no good if people know uh, about uh, 1789, about 1968, about the Crusades or the Reconquista, uh, if they do not know on which side to size. And so, I mean, if students know, know about the French Revolution or about 1968, but if they are convinced that they know uh, who's on the right side, and if they think that it is the left side, of course, which is the right side, then knowing the facts doesn't doesn't help also. Uh, if they are convinced, yes, if they know about the Crusades, but they think that the good people were, of course, the Muslim and the attackers, the evil people were, of course, the, 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 the Western Western Christianity, then, then facts don't, don't help. So it's also about the interpretation and uh, if we look at modern modern school books or even university manuals, it is it is very clearly uh, to which side they they tend. So once again, we would need a total reform of this system. That uh, once again, I cannot see how we can manage that from the within, at least not in a democratic system. So we need to build up uh, parallel circuits. No, and also, one of the concrete solutions that you are proposing, you just put it on the table, but is to fight the TikTokization and the Twitterization of minds. Maybe it's to teach how to read 10 pages without checking your phone, for example. Uh, we, there is a problem of uh, intellectual of IQ. There is a problem of focus, of concentration among new, new generations. Um, so what do we do there? I mean, is it possible that in 10 years nobody is going to read Plato? Just it's too long? Or maybe a Twitter type of uh, summary? And it's already the case now. Indeed. So the thing that's you know it's also about the cognitive skills, you know, and maybe we have also to face the reality, and admit that we may have to teach two persons that are less intelligent than their previous generations. That's extremely uh, controversial what I said, but I keep it. Um, Ignacy, and just before I ask you one of the questions, we will also have a bit of time for uh, questions from the audience, so don't hesitate to um, to prepare them. And then after your questions, I will ask the panelists to give us very concrete bullet points, you know, like a concrete list of solutions to start winning this war. Ignacy, you're, you are a, a lobbyist, you are in touch with a lot of international organizations, European organizations, this is where we met in the European Commission some, time, some years ago. What is your impression? Are you also fighting against them or can you cooperate and work with them? All those ideas that we are criticizing now, are they the mantras of the people you are talking to or not? Well, it depends a lot on the forum, no? Like I would say, at the United Nations level, that um, where, that where one of the spots where I am, um, we are not just um, talking with European countries, but also we are talking a lot with Arab countries and Asian countries and some and some Latin American countries that they just don't get some of the values of the world culture. So, um, good news. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, there the discussion, I would say, and as the, the goal of the United Nations is to, to is consensus, not the half plus one. Um, there are many, uh, in, at least in the resolutions where we are, we are as OIDEL, we are more involved, um, even though especially like some European countries are really focused on the idea of comprehensive sexual education as an essential part of the right to education, doesn't have any succeed so far because um, 
because many um, countries they just don't get this idea. You know, it's against their cultural background and and basically doesn't pass. There, a, a big debate we, fight, we face is privatization, and there is a the idea that um, independent actors in the field of education can be dangerous, and there. Some Arab states and some Latin American states, even though they don't like some woke values, they are really happy to say, yeah, let's just have public control over schools. Um, and that's one thing we are facing. In the, in the European level there, it, it gets different. Um, I think one of the main challenges we are facing there is while I would say left parties, they, they have some sort of agenda and we can see like especially um, no, this idea of freedom as emancipation is really linked with many ideas they are having on, on even on the idea of digitalization, like tablets is like a neutral thing, like kids could um, be exposed to tablets without no problem, or even, yeah, as I was saying, sexual education, maybe it's also one part of that, no, like the more they know, the more choices there will be. I see on among right-wing parties, um, they want to do things, but sometimes the problem is like there is a... Um, lack of initiative. I'm going to put you an example. I was talking with an MEP that was not part of ECR, but from a right-wing party, and I was like, what is the priority of, of your group? And he was like, digitalization. And I was like, wow, that's so controversial. I don't know, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the problems, you know, that some people don't want to get burned when they get into this field, and it's important to acknowledge this, this reality also in these debates, because we are leaving all this floor for other parties just to succeed on, on, on their plans. <laughs> It's hopeless what you just told us. Uh, oh, it's, um, it's, it's funny and hopeless at the same time. Oh, digitalization. Any questions from the floor? Mike, please. Then Mr. I, I just really want to thank the four of you. You've done a terrific job. I know this is, this is said about every panel. But I think the four of you have done a terrific job. And the Yours has been amazing. Uh, just one brief comment and then a question. The brief comment is in the US, the political momentum is on our side. <coughs> uh, so, and we have the, the benefit of having federalism. We have 50 sovereign states. I travel the country. <coughs> it is difficult to get politicians to talk about race and sex, uh, but, but <coughs> they're very reluctant to do it, but, but there is a great deal of momentum. The question I wanted to ask is, and you may not have thought about this, I'm writing a paper on all this. I'm writing a paper on, on, on the solution to this. And I just, somebody mentioned 89, I think, Stephen, you did. The New York Times actually wrote an article in, in 1989, the, the former Moscow bureau chief, Amity Berenger, saying, oh my God, communism is being defeated in Europe, but it's winning in, in the universities. She, I mean, she was actually detected this. She said it's changing from a focus, a focus on economics to its race and sex, but it is winning. <laughs> and what we have discovered, me and my co-author, he said, this is really the children of the new left beginning to take over the faculty lounge. And, and, and something happened in the new left in the 60s. And I, I don't know if you've thought about this, maybe you haven't, but I think to, 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 to reach a solution, we have to first understand what happened with the new left in the 60s, especially the late 60s, that then metastasizes into these cultural Marxists who really begin to understand how they, they're going to win, and they're going to win through the long march to the institutions. Have any of you given a thought to this about what materially changes in the 60s? No, thank you very much. Yeah, this, this French virus that became an American disease. Please, gentlemen. <clears throat> thank you for that question and your, and your uh, generous comment, uh, Mike. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, well, one thing I would initially say about uh, 1989 and the lessons we can learn again uh, today is that um, we have to be ready also to suffer and find meaning in suffering uh, in order to um, persevere and in the end uh, be victorious. That's really uh, under the surface what happened in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, Many anonymous people, we will never know their names, uh, books or movies will not be made about them, but they were willing to suffer. And I think that is the source of strength for many of these countries. For example, Poland and Hungary that have the strength to uh, contradict um, the authorities in Brussels, the narrative in Brussels, and say, no, we have a different view of Europe. And uh, that takes a lot of uh, strength and willingness to, to endure um, 
intimidation and so on. And, and many of, I think, these nations have, have lost this strength, have, have yielded uh, for too long, and uh, then it's difficult to uh, resist um, once you get used to uh, losing and simply turning, turning your, um, your head the other direction. So, um, but we, when, when we discuss the West and uh, 1968 and what's happened since then, you know, at the base of this, I would say, psychologically is this uh, urge to, to rebel, to um, against authority, of course, but in the end against God, against nature. And uh, that's a very powerful uh, impulse in human beings, especially among young people. Um, I've met many parents uh, who sent their children to um, American universities and said after a year or two they could hardly recognize their own children. Uh, that's the reality. So we're, we're facing... And not least because sometimes they came without part of their bodies. Unfortunately, those are, those are the real tragic uh, cases, but that's what we're talking about, that uh, these universities are so uh, subversive and are abusing their privileged status in society and their, you know, I would say false prestige, but it is a certain kind of prestige that opens doors in, in, uh, later in life. So, uh, and, and to pay for this is, is such, a, such a tremendous injustice. Like I said, I probably would not send my son to Harvard for uh, zero tuition. Uh, that's how uh, dangerous I think it is to his uh, personality. Um, but the fact is, is that um, there is deep in many human beings, you know, resentment, um, uh, hatred, can also uh, be a strong motivator. So we have uh, people uh, who have grown up in the most privileged societies on earth who, who hate their own countries. And this is uh, something that we also see um, in many places, this new narrative when children are lo learning history, uh, Western history. So there's, there's much to, to discuss, many, many causes for all of this, but uh, we have to be aware that the young are vulnerable and we have to take our responsible, responsibility seriously. In the end, uh, we have to remind ourselves that <clears throat> adults exist for the sake of children, not the way, other way around. So children do not exist for our sake. Uh, we exist for their sake and we have to take this responsibility seriously. Thank you, Ignacy. David, maybe a quick reaction to my uh, comments before we also take the question of Mr. Saviev. Okay, um, yeah, um, w one thing, and I might be wrong about that, as in many other things, but um, no, one thing I'm, 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 th I'm seeing in the field of education is like sometimes we tend to think like the people who are against, for instance, freedom to education or freedom of, of speech are just natural successors of, of former socialism. But I see two things, like many of the authors that are writing on this topic, to be honest, I, I'm pretty, I'm, they say so, and I believe it, that they are in favor of free market and they are in favor of democracy. And I even have friends like who are working in the corporate world, lawyers in the pharmaceutical companies, that they are in favor of free market. But then the problem for me many times is the definition of, of freedom that they have. They understand freedom as emancipation or freedom that liberates um, citizens from everything. And I think here, um, that's where it gets problematic because freedom so far was the capacity for everybody to choose what it was good. And at the moment, it's freedom to liberate yourself. Um, it's problematic. And to part. fulfill all your desires. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a problem here that a Christian school, for instance, can be problematic because it's forcing kids to be Christians, they would say, or free speech in universities could be problematic because they could be delivering biological realities or sociological realities that are shaping the reality of the, that doesn't allow the person to emancipate. And I think um, more than a, com there, the, indeed, there has been communists that are happy to be against these sort of freedoms, but I think also there has been a mutation within people with liberal values or as we would say, well, as we would say in Europe, liberal values or conservative values in the US that, their, their idea of freedom is freedom as emancipation. And quoting Demons of Democracy, that we have the author of the book here, I think one of the, the, the threats here is like, within the liberal world, there are many people that also want that all the institutions have a liberal perspective, you no know, family, a school, and if there is a comprehensive set of values um, that a family is trying to transmit that are not completely linked with liberal values, this is conflictual for them. And I think that's a, 
a reality that we have to acknowledge that among people against freedom of education, there is people that believe in freedom, but it just, they just change the, they just mutate the definition of this freedom, and that's one of the main challenges today. And accept the hegemony, which is indeed part of the problem. Mr. Safiyev, please, you, you also had a question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's probably a question and also reaction too. Uh, the first, we're speaking about um, creating new universities, but we are dealing not only with the teaching, but the whole industry, peer review journals. Basically, now t tyranny. You submit articles, and we are against diversity. We speak about diversity, but if if you have uh, opinion, different opinion, you ca you have no chance to be published. And for any scholar, you need to build your publication list, etc. So. I, I really, should we start from the scratch or fight in this industry because it's publications? We're speaking about um, the newspapers, op-ed. Now we uh, reduce to 500 words and you are required to explain some sensitive historical issues within the 500 words. So I think it's not only about university, creating new university, but also about the whole industry, publications, peer review journals, op -ed. And second, um, it's probably a bit um, a warning. I grew up in the Soviet Union. You, sp you spoke about the importance of classical uh, education, etc. Um, probably the conservatism does not mean against the change because what I've uh, seen when I was growing up in the Soviet Union, TV, radio, we were airing only classical music. Uh, you, you wouldn't hear the rock music, pop music. Uh, I think it's not the way uh, the modern conservative should go, just only focus on, on something classical, 19th century. Probably conservatives should embrace modern trend, especially in the art, because I think the, the experience of the Soviet Union with all this emphasis on the classic uh, things, it, it failed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you made an excellent point on the publications. If you want to react extremely quickly, please, because we have to, uh, to, 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 to round up, but maybe quickly, I have a reaction first. Uh, yeah, well, s spontaneously. Well, I'm, 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 I'm not absolutely sure about the classic uh, thing. I think that uh, classical aesthetic is something that is absolute, that is not just relative, that is not just passing by, but that is uh, a value in itself. Uh, and so focusing on, on classics, be it, be it now, uh, uh, late Romanticism or Baroque or Renaissance music or whatever is absolutely necessary and I can, can just join uh, Professor Lidigutko with what he said also at the, at, at the beginning. Uh, for me it is, it is always nearly shocking when I'm at conservative events or speeches or political rallies and, uh, or, or even, even summer schools like, like this summer when I was at the summer school of the Academia Christiana uh, in Angers which did a Splendid job, uh, really informing young people, and then in the evening they turn on, the, on this, this this kind of boom, boom, boom uh, music, which is for me the absolute antithesis to everything we we need to we need to defend. And I think we need to be much clearer to that respect as conservatives that we also have to form our own our own conservative aesthetic and to tie back with the true values of our past. And music or aesthetics is not something that is that is relative, as I said, it is absolute. And uh, today's world with its, its, absolute, its, its, its total ugliness, be it in architecture, in so-called art, in music, is something that needs to be fully rejected. And I think that every conservative who is, um, every decent conservative who really wants to, to, to merit this name needs also to, to, to train his own uh, style and his own uh, taste, I would say, and to reject all these things as being fully detrimental in every way, even to our soul. If I may, just, just one comment on the publication. One of the scholars I, I mentioned in my introduction, Peter Bogosian, who happens to be now with us in MCC in Budapest, is an extremely liberal person, but an honest one. He, five years ago, he started publishing fake papers just to show, you know, how, I mean, how, how rubbish all those extremely prestigious um, uh, publications are and how corrupted this peer review system is. Just to give you one example, one of those fake papers was the influence of white patriarchy on the rape culture of dogs in Brooklyn. And it was published. <laughs> so, speaking about corruption. Um, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have to finish now. I'm very tempted to ask you, uh, like to give you 15 seconds and to, so that you give us just very quickly, one by one, some concrete solutions in a TikTok style. So again, 15, mm -hmm. 20 seconds, bullet points, so that we can finish more or less on time, because of course we have a coffee break. This is a new direction event. They feed us from, uh, from nine to nine. Ignacy, TikTok style, please. Okay. Just two clues to, to continue this discussion. I think there are two clues that we have to bear in mind to overcome that. First is that education has to serve for the full development of the human personality, and that means to take into consideration the human being as something more than isolated island, but part of a community and who lives in a concrete culture. And second, that um, pluralism, uh, that um, freedom in education um, is a tool to achieve bigger things. And I think if we work on this direction, we can overcome some of the definitions we've been told. Thank you. David, TikTok style as well. We need to recognize that we are a persecuted man minority and we have to behave like that. We have lost the society, so we need to form a closed circuit, exactly as do, for example, Muslim migrant societies. We as conservative and as Christians need to form a similar closed society where education, where business, where faith all are intertwined and are interdependent. And as it is so difficult to do that from a Western European point of view, the East, that is Poland and Hungary, need to help the West with that endeavor. They are already doing it, but they need to, to do it even better. Thank you. Stephen? Uh, truth has power. Uh, there is certainly hope if there's enough people with courage uh, to speak it. Um, we can change uh, the path of history. It's been done in the past, and hopefully we can do it with a smile. Thank you. Thank you. If I add one more solution, I think, for example, the place where I work, Matthias Corvinus Collegium, is exactly the type of countercultural institutions that we need. Save six, seven years ago, the first time I heard about wokeism was through a concept called jazz hands, you know. And jazz hands is basically shaking your hands instead of clapping, because clapping, you know, is noisy and might offend a lot of persons who are, of course, very sensitive snowflakes. So please, let's do exactly the contrary and let's break into a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.